Hi everyone, um, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, ideal gases and um, how pressure, temperature and volume are related together. Um, just a quick reminder that last lesson we looked at um, the kinetic theory of gases. We talked about all the assumptions. Please make sure you're familiar with them, they're very important. Uh, we also talked about how to um, explain pressure in terms of Newton's laws of motion. Um, we also looked at substance in terms of moles and number of molecules and so on. Um, you might be wondering still, why did we even care about the chemistry side of things? Well, it's not just chemistry, it's applicable to everything and we will be using it in uh, today's lesson, uh, especially the number of moles as a symbol and um, um, as part of an equation. And um, in the next lesson, we'll also look at, oh, actually in this lesson as well, we'll be looking at the number of molecules as part of the equation. Okay, so um, to start with, uh, today we're going to have a look at the equation of state of an ideal gas, how we get to that stage, basically. Uh, we'll break it down first into um, PV is equal to a constant, PT is equal to a constant. And you do need to know the techniques and procedures used to investigate them. So to do how to do the practical work and how to ensure that it's as accurate as possible. Also, how we can use those um, uh, results to obtain absolute zero from one of the experiments. Uh, so this is more of uh, experimental work. And you can see next to this is pack eight because it's part of experimental work that, should, that you should know um, for your exams. Then we will also have a look at the root mean uh, square speed and mean square speed and uh, how, well, this equation as well, which is another equation that's uh, related to ideal gases. Um, and then in the next lesson, we'll have a look at the last two uh, points, uh, last two, three, three points, sorry. So these last three will be in lesson three. Okay, so we're going to start first with the um, equation of uh, an ideal gas, how, how we end up to that point. Okay, so what is the relationship first between pressure and volume? Uh, do remember that lowercase p stands for pressure and capital uh, V uh, stands for volume. Um, so the first law relay it's Boyle's law. It relates um, the pressure of an ideal gas to its volume only and only if the temperature and the mass are constant. So if I have an ideal gas um, that is at a constant temperature and I don't increase or decrease the mass, so I keep it constant, if I increase the pressure, so if I increase the pressure, then uh, the volume of the container will, the volume of the gas will decrease. So basically if I have the volume, that means I have my denominator here, that will mean my pressure would double. Or uh, instead of seeing it as pressure is inversely proportional, which is the ideal behind it, we can say P times V is equal to a constant number. Because what this means is P is equal to a constant K divided by V. So if I rearrange the equation, P times V is equal to a constant K. Uh, we will look at that in a second, what that means. Um, so if I decided to double the pressure, so 2 times the pressure, in order to keep K the same, because you can't change both sides, right? So you'll have to have the volume, or if you have the volume, you double the pressure. Um, so what would it look like as a graph? So a graph would look like, since they're inversely proportional to each other, it's not a straight line, it will be a um, line looking like that. Um, now if I had, um, if I did change the temperature to a higher temperature, then the line will look like this, because if you think about it, a higher temperature means uh, much more movement, kinetic energy, much more collisions, which will mean that more collisions increase the pressure. So you will expect for 
of for them to occupy more volume uh, and at a higher pressure. So these are called isotherms. They're the same line but shifted higher, basically. So it's an isotherm at a higher temperature. Um, now, how, would that, how can I make this line into a straight line? Uh, I will have to plot the results of P against 1 over V. So that is a straight line. And um, if I plot that, it will be a straight line through the origin, since there is no y-intercept uh, involved in this equation. Um, my gradient would obviously be equal to a constant number. Now, how can I investigate this relationship? Can I, how can I figure out how P and V vary uh, experimentally? Well, this is Boyle's law, like I said before already. And what you will need as equipment, and you will need to know this as well, um, you need uh, a volume scale that has a uh, some gas, uh, air basically trapped in here. Oh, there is gas under pressure. So this is a gas trapped under pressure. Uh, the oil is uh, trapping the air in. Uh, then we have a, a long wire connected to a foot pump so that you can uh, increase the pressure. And you also have a pressure gauge uh, that measures the pressure in pascals. So what you can do is um, increase the pressure of uh, on the oil by uh, using the foot pump. And the pressure exerted on the air by the oil will be shown uh, on the pressure gauge. And the volume, so you're measuring the pressure exerted by the oil on the uh, gas here. So this is the pressure that you will read, the pressure of the uh, gas exerted by the oil. And uh, you can read the volume from this scale here. For a few bits and pieces for this experiment, you always have to start the experiment with the valve open. Um, that's to allow the apparatus to be at high pressure and then you close the valve. So It's a very, very important part uh, when you do this experiment. It's the biggest one that will stand out in exam questions. Um, when, you, when you take the readings, or even when you do the first starting part where you open the valve fully and um, then you close it, you have to wait a few minutes. Um, and that's to allow um, the air to uh, warm up slightly uh, because as you are basically pushing the piston, you're transferring energy into the system and that will raise the internal energy. Um, so you have to wait for the gas to uh, cool down to room temperature before you take any measurements. Um, so what you will start doing is releasing the valve slowly uh, to reach the next pressure that you want to record the um, volume at, uh, the volume of the air at. But you need to always, between each reading, you have to change the volume slowly. And that's to ensure that the temperature remains constant. Because every time you um, change the pressure acting on the gas, you're doing work on the gas that causes the air particles to move faster. And then that means if they're moving faster, then the temperature will uh, increase. And we said that for this to work, for P to be inversely proportional to V, the temperature has to be constant. So that's the key part of um, this experiment. And so basically as the gas starts to cool down, it will be doing work to the surroundings and then that's why you always have to allow for the temperature to stabilize. So for it to reach basically thermal equilibrium again, with his surroundings, so that it's always at the same temperature that you take your readings at. Um, the other thing that you do need to do is wear eye protection for safety and try definitely not to exceed the maximum pressure. 
and also to watch out for any leaks of oil um, uh, otherwise you know you can eject oil and then make it a bit more dangerous around you so what you will end up if you plot p against v you will end up with this graph and uh, this is the point where i'm going to go through now what we meant by um, p times v is equal to constant now for a gas at a constant temperature with the same amount of mass uh, for gas um, that means that if i took if i had initially uh, for example my first measurement was let's pick the first value that's easy to read, 0 0.1 and 4. And if I had times pressure times uh, volume, remember that there's also a reading on the axis. So in other words, my pressure is 4 times 10 to the 5 times the volume, which is uh, 0 0.1 meters cubed. Uh, then I will end up with um, 0 0.4 times... 10 to the 5 and if I take another reading now which is again the same uh, gas mass the same mass of gas at the same temperature uh, then if I take the reading here this is another easy number to figure out so that's uh, 1 times 10 to the 5 for the pressure times 0 0.4 for the volume that means I get the same exact value. So, in other words, I can say P1 times V1 is equal to <clears throat> P2V2. Um, so, we always can use this uh, in terms of a situation where uh, we know the initial um, pressure and volume of specific gas uh, at a specific temperature. And then we know the situation after, so we know what the pressure is, and that will allow us to be able to calculate the volume if I know all these three, for example. Um, so that's what PV is equal to a constant means. And these graphs are better looking than my ones, so I just thought I'd put them there. This is P against V um, for a gas at a constant temperature, and you can see the relationships below. I just proved it to you as well on the graph. And then we have the P against 1 over V, which will give you a straight line going through the um, um, origin here. Um, this is at a higher, higher temperature. And it will, does make sense because if it's at a higher temperature, if you consider them being at the same volume and at higher temperature, you would expect a, a higher temperature to have a higher pressure since it's increasing the movement of particles and the same thing here as well b is at a higher temperature so the other relationship that we need to know about um, the macroscopic properties of ideal gases is the pressure uh, the relationship between pressure and temperature so we know that um, if we uh, if the volume and mass remain the co constant in this case of the gas then the pressure of an ideal gas is directly proportional to its absolute temperature in Kelvin. Absolute means that it has to be measured in Kelvin. When we talk about absolute temperature, it means Kelvin. We can't use degrees Celsius. The equation does not apply to that, uh, and it doesn't work properly. But if you want to convert from Kelvin to uh, sorry from degrees Celsius to Kelvin, you just simply add two hundred seventy three to degrees Celsius. And you get it into Kelvin. That means that if I uh, double the temperature, then the pressure doubles. Because if you remember that if P is directly proportional to T, that means P is equal to a constant pressure, is equal to a constant times temperature. So if I double the pressure, I have to double the temperature since this is a constant to keep both sides the same exact way. Um, so there's also a practical that you need to know about this. It's part of the PAGs. Um, hopefully we'll get time to do them this year with the current situation going on. Um, but this is the experiment that you do need to know. So what you will be using um, is a heater. If you 
if you're not given an option for a heater you can also set up a um, very big uh, beaker with um, the same uh, things inside so the thermometer the uh, flask and so on but it has to be uh, on a tripod with a Bunsen burner if there is no option for um, you know an electric heater because it's an electric heater um, you will also need uh, to make sure that the flask doesn't touch the bottom of the beaker otherwise it will heat it up extremely you have uh, basically you will have an even um, temperature rises throughout and also the thermometer shouldn't be touching the uh, bottom of the beaker for safety reasons. So you could use both of them. Um, you will need a pressure gauge connected to your flask that has dry air, which is a fixed mass. Uh, so it will be trapped in there. The mass of the air won't change. Um, the volume is fixed. So constant mass, constant volume. You can't change the volume through this. The only thing that we are doing is we're changing the temperature. And then we measure pressure using the pressure gauge. Um, the heater is there to change the temperature uh, at specific increments. The thermometer is to make sure that the temperature is changing at the specific increments we want. And uh, the sealed uh, uh, flask is there to make sure that uh, the mass, no gas escapes. Um, just a few points about this experiment. Um, you have to make sure that the flask doesn't touch the bottom of the beaker. Uh, and also that the water covers the entire flask. As you can see here very clearly, it covers it up to the um, bank, the rubber bank. Um, you need to make sure that the thermometer doesn't touch the container either. Uh, you should wear eye protection. And for safety as well, you do need to use a safety screen just in case this uh, uh, flask uh, shatters, just in case the pressure gets too much to the point where it shatters and you need to protect yourselves. Um, now for errors, there could be leaks through the flask, the valve or the pressure gauge um, so um, things like that that you can mention that can cause um, errors in your measurements so if there's a leak through the rubber bank obviously your mass will not be the same uh, it won't, would not remain constant so you end up is getting lower pressure um, okay so let's say I got the results and I plotted a graph of pressure against temperature now it doesn't have to be in uh, degrees Celsius it could be in uh, Kelvin but the idea is that um, you plot your points, right, at room temperature, above room temperature, because obviously you won't start at zero degrees, you unless you use ice. But um, yeah, you'll you'll start at let's say room temperature and you start heating it up, and you collect a selection of results. In the in our labs, we can't really recreate uh, very uh, cold conditions for what we're doing. So the only way for you to be able to use your graph to find absolute zeros is the graph to use to um, to estimate absolute zero. So if I plotted this graph uh, and I got my values of P against uh, temperature, then I could extrapolate my line because it will be a straight line. Uh, and it will cross the x-axis, the temperature axis, uh, at some point. And that point that it crosses it at will be minus 273 degrees, or else that we know as zero Kelvin. Obviously, it won't be exactly there because we will have errors uh, in our measurements. But the key point here is how can you use this graph and is to extrapolate. This is a key part. If you forget the word, just sketch it and show that this is an extrapolation. So I dashed the line. A line that has gaps basically is uh, what you need to show on your graph. Okay, so now that we have seen that uh, PV is equal to a constant 
and that uh, p over t is equal to a constant. We can combine them together and say that pv over t is equal to a constant. So in other words, if we had uh, the same amount of gas, the same mass of gas, um, and we change pressure, volume, or temperature, then if we change the conditions from initial to final state, then we will get this equation. Or we can rewrite it instead of writing initial, initial, final, final, final. We can write P1V1 over T1 is equal to P2V2 over T2. These are all valid for ideal gases as long as they remain uh, at a much higher temperature than their boiling point and um, at a very low pressure. Uh, if the pressure gets too high, then these rules um, actually don't work. And we call them gas laws because they apply to most gases, um, which actually uh, they do break down uh, if the gas is close to its boiling point or at a very high pressure. Um, so then we're going to also introduce some more equations. But before we do so, um, I wanted to look at this example to show how you can use it. Uh, so what we have is, we talked about a weather balloon, balloon, which has a volume this much. So I'm going to name this V1. Uh, and it's launched on a day when the atmospheric pressure, so we know the P1, the atmospheric pressure, and the temperature. We need to change this into Kelvin, so I'm just going to write a note there that I need to put this in Kelvin. At the ground level. So this is the, our P1, V1, T1, because at the ground level. Then it rises to a level where the air pressure is 20% of the pressure on the ground. So I need to calculate that pressure. So P2 is 20% of what it is on uh, the ground. So it's 20% of 100 kilo, 101 kilopascals times 20%. Uh, that's my P2. And the air temperature is minus 15, so that's my T2, which I need to change into Kelvin. Calculate the volume, so I need to calculate V2. We know from my equation that P1, V1, divided by T1 is equal to P2, V2, divided by T2. I need to calculate V2, so I'm just going to rearrange my equation to make it nicer. Uh, so V2 is equal to P1, V1, T2, divided by um, T1, P2. And there I have it. Just simply need to put my numbers in now after I convert them. Okay, so the only thing that you simply need to do is uh, place your values in. Don't, don't forget, kilopascals is times 10 to the 3 uh, to change from degrees to Kelvin, you add, so minus 15, for example, for T2, minus 50 plus 273. Uh, for this one, you can simply, uh, this this is the same as saying 0 0.2. So um, here you can see that all the values have been placed. And also, very, very important, we need to keep the correct units. Uh, we need meters cubed. We don't want mini millimeters cubed or centimeters cubed. They need to be converted to meters cubed. Uh, we need pascals, not kilopascals or millipascals or whatever. Um, we also need Kelvin. So for this equation to work, here, uh, we need that to be in pascals, volume to be in meters cubed, and temperature to be in Kelvin. If you use degrees Celsius, you will lose your marks. Um, unfortunately, you need to use Kelvin. It is one of the uh, base units, one of the SI units. So please uh, remember that one. Okay, to kind of wrap up this equation that we have just introduced and all this relationship between P, V and T. Now, if I had, um, if I had one mole of an ideal gas, uh, and I had to relate P, V, and T together. So if I had one mole only, uh, let me write that down. Oh, it's here. So if I had one mole of ideal gas, and I use this equation to calculate P V times V divided by T, the answer would be equal to 8.31 
Jules for Kelvin for mole. By the way, just to remind you, this is not standard units. Uh, only Kelvin and moles are base units. So if you had to convert um, them to uh, all base units, SI units, you will need to convert uh, joules into base units. Uh, but that's uh, something that we can check another time when we're doing exam questions. Um, so uh, we, we call this equation PV over T is equal to N times R, where N is the number of moles. We call it the equation of state of an ideal gas. Uh, now, what this equation gives us is it tells us that uh, depending on the amount of moles of a substance you have, sorry, depending on the amount of moles of a substance you have, uh, then your answer will be equal to 8.31, that constant that we were saying before. This is applicable only for ideal gases. That's very important. And let's uh, do a quick question here. So a... Uh, 3.5 meters cubed pressurized gas container. Sorry, container contains 400. So we have the volume. Whoop, it's not writing. So we have the volume. We have the moles, N. And we have the temperature, which I need to change into Kelvin. So it's 25 plus 273. This is to calculate the pressure of the gas inside the container. So I already see that I have P, V, T, and N. R is actually a constant. We call it the molar mass constant. The constant of one mole of an ideal gas is called the molar uh, mass constant, which is 8.31. So I know R as well, since it's a constant. So I know that P... Uh, v over T is equal to NR. I need to calculate P, so I'll leave it on its own. I times both sides of the equation by T, and I divide both sides by V, which leaves me with this expression. I place the numbers in, which is 425 moles times 8.31 times 298 Divide that by the volume. So you get 3 times 10 to the 5 pascals. And the last part um, about uh, this equation, PV is equal to NRT, is when we analyze uh, a graph for it. So I already said that my equation is PV over T is equal to NR. I'm going to make it into a simpler expression, so just leave it as PV is equal to NRT. And I know that uh, this equation can actually give me a graph, um, especially since I know that Y is equal to MX plus C. Now, if I compare the two equations, there is no Y intercept at all because there is no plus or minus sign. And uh, if I wanted to plot PV against T, so if we have a look on the graph, PV against T, so my y-axis is PV, my x-axis is T. So I have y is PV, and which is equal, so the whole expression here is PV. Uh, and I know that I have NRT. I also know that my X is the axis stands for T. So my gradient is equal to NR, the number of moles times a constant. So for example, my line should go through the origin since this is zero. And it should be a straight line. So if I were to calculate the gradient, my gradient. Remember, you need to use the biggest triangle when you're uh, calculating gradients, and you need to show it, otherwise you don't get marks. So the gradient is equal to nr. And once you calculate the gradient, you can also find how many uh, the number of moles of a gas, of an ideal gas, since you already know that r is a constant, which is 8.31. 
Um, so how can we get a steeper gradient uh, in this kind of uh, diagram? Um, we, since the only part of the gradient that can change out of these two numbers is n, it's just use a substance with a higher number of moles, basically. Okay, so now for a very quick review, we have looked at the state of an ideal gas, equation of state of an ideal gas. We even talked about the graphical representation, the techniques and procedures, how to estimate absolute zero using the gas, tem gas temperature and pressure. And now we're going to be reviewing these two. First, I'm going to go through what root mean squared uh, speed is and mean squared speed. Um, you do need to pay attention to that. We will also look at uh, the characteristics of a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution on a graph. And um, we will look at this equation, even though you don't need um, to know for this equation here uh, how to derive it. Um, I might do an extra video if you want me to, or we'll do it in class if you want me to go through that in class. Um, and the next lesson, we'll be looking at this. Okay, so what um what we're gonna what I'm gonna introduce now is uh in terms of the root mean squared speed and squared speed. So to understand that, um, we need to discuss firstly what happens to the gas particles in a container. So if I had a lot of gas particles in a container, we said that they all move in random directions at random speeds. And um, since they, we, the velocity is speed in a different direction, we have to take into account the negative signs that they have and the positive direction that they're traveling in, in three dimensions. Now, if I were supposed to add all of the values, I'm just going to use four here for simplicity. But let's say I was adding, uh, I wanted to find the mean velocity of these uh, values then what I will have to do is add them up. And divide them by four, since I have four measurements, right? So that's minus 500 plus 500. That gives me zero over four. So my mean velocity is zero meters per second. Now that's not very useful for us. Um, and and it's obvious that they will cancel out an average of zero because we are taking into account their different directions. Now, if I consider the speeds, it will be different. I can add them all without the signs in front of them. So it will be 450 plus 50 plus 100 plus 400 divided by 4. That will be 1,000 divided by 4. That will give me 250 meters per second. But that doesn't give me the ideal uh, value. So what we are interested in, what you should be doing in, in the, the next formula that we're going to see, is to calculate the uh, mean uh, squared speed to begin with. So this is supposed to be mean, be mean squared speed. So what that means, I will square all the values. So I'll do 450 squared. By the way, means, mean squared speed has a symbol of c squared with a line over it. Um, so that's 450 squared plus 50 squared plus 100 squared. Now we are ignoring all of the positive and negative signs because they will cancel out anyway with the squared factor. And we're talking about speed anyway, so we don't consider the direction of the velocity. Then I will uh, simply divide that by 4 because I have 4 of those values. So I square the speed values while I'm adding them up. I divide that by 4 and I will end up getting uh, about 1,116,250. And what we mean by the mean, the root... Um, well, the, this is the mean squared speed, firstly. Mean squared speed. Which is the symbol C squared. So in your equations, in, the, in actually in example questions or um, exam questions, they might give you the um, root um, mean squared speed. So 
root mean squared speed root mean squared speed that simply means that um, you get the mean squared speed and you take the root of it to find out the average speed um, kind of idea uh, of particles but it's not the same thing uh, because otherwise it comes out to zero the average speed in a way they're not the same values uh, to do that you just take the square root of the value you calculated above and you will end up with something around 340 meters per second we usually show it as a symbol of c r m s okay it's because we squared rooted the uh, value that you got here um and even if you added all these values together remember when i told you that if you add the speeds only together you get about 250 meters per second it doesn't come out to be the same as this value we are interested in this value though uh, so please if it does come to you having to calculate it you need to distinguish between them a common mistake in exams is that people confuse this speed and this speed and i'll i'll tell you clearly which one to which values to use if you have to square it or square root it Okay, so now uh, we come to the equation that uh, I was talking about initially. PV is equal to one third N, uh, which is for, so pressure is for, P is for pressure, sorry, which is measured in Pascals always. So pressure in Pascals. V is for volume measured in meters cubed. One third this actually um, is part of the derivation, but it's since we have three dimensions and um, it's part of that, um, but you don't, you don't need to know about it um, unless you want me to go through it in class. Um, then it's the N stands for the uh, number of particles in the gas. M is for the mass of uh, each particle. So if you have, let's say, O2 molecules and you have to take um, the mass of each O2 molecule and multiply by the number of uh, O2 molecules that you have in there. And then C, uh, this is supposed to have a line over it, sorry. C squared uh, is the mean squared speed of the particles. So in other words, when we calculated before in the example here, this was the mean squared this is the number that you should be including in your calculation. So if you are given the root mean speed, all you have to do to the root mean speed is square it to get the mean squared speed. Uh, just be careful, okay, with that one. It's a big confusion to a lot of people. So C, C squared is not the same as CRMS, root mean squared speed. Um, so now, just to summarize, we have two equations. Uh, pressure of a gas, which is newtons per meter squared, or um, meters cubed, actually. No, meter squared, which is uh, pascals as well. Volume meters cubed, and number of moles of the gas. Um, I'm not going to go through this, you can read through it. Uh, but the idea is that um, what you have here is two equations that link different things together. So some, one equation could be talking about number of moles, another one could be talking about number of molecules, or you might have to calculate the mass of something. So you always need to make those choices uh, in terms of which equation to use, but they both have to do with ideal gases. And last but not least is the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution that you're supposed to know the key features of. Um, so we saw root mean squared speed. Uh, as an average but it's only an average so in reality in a gas we have different speeds in different directions and um, every single particle will be traveling at a different speed but they, they some of them that will have the same speed there's, there's too many uh, you know billions of particles uh, at a time usually in a container so what we see in the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution is the range of speeds 
So what you have on this axis is the number of molecules or atoms at a certain speed. Uh, and this is the speed of the particles. So basically, uh, uh, and you can see that there's three different lines at zero degrees, at a thousand degrees, and at two thousand degrees. Uh, if we focus on this one first, on the zero degrees one, so what you see is that uh, at a, at a low speed, so um, we have a f very few um, particles at that speed, but if you look at uh, here, for example, this is the um, most uh, probable speed, basically. So most particles will have that speed. Um, and then you can see the whole range of them, basically. So what you can see is that at zero degrees, particles can travel uh, from zero degrees to a specific number. Uh, but there are more uh, particles at the most probable speed uh, than they are at the mean speed and then they are at the uh, root mean square speed. Uh, but you can also see that these particles that have much higher speeds, even though they're not as many as uh, the ones at the most probable speed. Now, if I increase the temperature, uh, you see that there's uh, particles that can have like from 1000 to 2000 as well, particles will gain more and more energy, so they will have uh, move faster. Uh, so you have a range from zero uh, meters per second to, I don't know, whatever value it could be, bigger values. So as you increase the temperature, the speed, the range of speed of particles increases. However, less and less particles will have the more probable speed, which increases again. So the most probable speed is constantly increasing with, um, uh, temperature as well. So you do need to know what a Maxwell Boltzmann distribution shows. So that it shows up that it shows the number of molecules against the speed of the particle of particles. Uh, sorry, the number of particles against the speed of particles and how it changes with temperature, especially the most probable speed of them. So going back again to the um, learning outcomes, we looked at the equation and discuss what um, each part is. We also looked at the root mean squared speed and the mean squared speed. Um, and we did look at Maxwell Boltzmann distribution and its characteristics. The rest is for lesson three, and that's it for chapter 15 for ideal gases. Please feel free to write down questions as well that you have and that you might not understand from the topic in your notes and I will answer that during the lesson.